DJ Sixsmith here at the Rose Hill Gym. First ever video edition of the Game Time Podcast. Couldn't have asked for a better guest. Joe Lenardi, ESPN Bracketologist. Joe, great to be with you. How are you today? Apparently no other English-speaking guest was available for the big <laughs> podcast. So, Joe, let's talk about your career. You've been working in sports for quite some time. When did you first realize you wanted to work in the sports industry? I think it was when I took the ball to the basket in the sixth grade and got rejected by every other taller guy in the school that uh, my exploits on the court were never going to reach a level of uh, <laughs> any, any renown. And uh, I've always been kind of a writer, speaker type, so it was a natural outlet for somebody who likes sports and likes to write to do what we do. So you went to St. Joe's, now cover St. Joe's as a radio analyst. When you were in college, what were some of the things that you did to help pr promote your career? I worked at a uh, daily newspaper called the Philadelphia Bulletin, whose slogan was, Nearly everybody reads the bulletin until everybody wasn't, and it went out of business. Uh, but I learned a ton about writing, about editing, about filing on deadline, about sports journalism from some of the greatest practitioners of that art. Uh, you know, when you're in a major media market as you guys are here, right. it's certainly, if, if, if you want to be in a laboratory and learn from the best, and force yourself to produce good content on deadline. Uh, that was a great kind of incubator for that. Uh, and of course I was, uh, I covered basketball for the student newspaper. I was essentially the editor of the student paper. I served in a leadership role in uh, university governance and, 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 and student leadership. Uh, I was just basically a pain in the ass around campus that people couldn't ignore. So Joe, college basketball is your baby. How did you first develop your love for basketball? Who was most influential in doing that for you? Uh, well, the love came from my older brothers, who also attended St. Joseph's and grew up in the Philadelphia Big Five, uh, which is a great tradition, uh, just like, you know, particularly New York Catholic basketball, just like high school Catholic basketball and then college basketball uh, in Philly with all the teams playing for us city title in the same building, a historic place, the Palestra. It was pretty hard not to get wrapped up in that. And then as a student, uh, the, the St. Joseph's coach at the time was uh, Coach Jim Lynham, and he took me under his wing a bit, taught me a lot about the game, and our athletic director, who's still around, uh, Don DeGiulia, explained to me how things worked at the NCAA level and kind of gave me a peek behind the curtain of the NCAA tournament at a time when it got not nearly the attention and scrutiny that it does today, but I guess it just kind of lit a spark and I've been scratching that itch ever since. So Joe, when you look at the way the NCAA tournament is today, it's analyzed, it's become a science, the bracket is a must break down every single year. When did you first realize that this could be something that you could spend your whole life doing? That was probably more of a gradual thing because in some respects I'm not doing anything differently now than I was when no one was paying attention to it. The only difference is, uh, you know, here we are less than a month into selections. You know, if I don't send an update up to ESPN about every 45 minutes, uh, you know, somebody thinks that, you know, I'm in a train wreck or something. <laughs> the world is ending. Right, and you know, it might just be that, well, the top team's at halftime and I can't update right. it yet. But uh, the, the, the immediacy of the internet and social media and, you know, the bottom line scroll under the screen, like, it's almost obscene for these next few weeks. You know, Joe Lenardi said, Joe Lenardi, like, I can't get my wife and children to pay attention to what I say, <laughs> but I mean, like, everybody's watching, like, somebody called me last night and said, I had it on for an hour, and, you know, they've mentioned your name 17 <laughs> times, like, that was never the intent, right. never the intent. Uh, I just wanted somebody to pay attention to the fact that, uh, the brackets could kind of be reasonably well predicted in advance. So how does ESPN first come into the picture? You've been there for quite some time now. When did that relationship first start? I was working and editing uh, the Blue Ribbon College Basketball Yearbook, which uh, old timers would, would kind of know as the preseason Bible. Uh, and then we added a postseason edition kind of under my shepherding uh, about 20 years ago. And producing that book and producing it well required understanding the field before it happened. So bracketology was really a means to a different end. Uh, how it ended up where it is, is one of those accidents of circumstance. Uh, and, and over time, 
we began uh, sharing kind of my napkin, if you will, for what the tournament might look like with a fledgling website called ESPN.com. And that marriage of, you know, internet immediacy and passion of fans of our sport kind of combined into something that no one really could have anticipated. So what people don't know is that outside the few months you're working for ESPN, you're working at St. Joe's, working in the marketing department, communications, but you teach a bracketology class. And that must just be a joy for you to see where this has all come from. So what does it mean to see your students helping out in the whole bracketology process along with you? Well, I, I, I'll give you an example. We have two four-week sessions this season. One is just now ending as we record this, and another one starts next week and will culminate, the, culminate excuse me, the week of selections. And uh, so on Tuesday night for about six hours, I'll have a dozen and a half students, and we'll put them through a committee exercise, much like the media mock that just took place in Indianapolis this week, and I've been fortunate enough to attend that a few times. So I, I feel reasonably comfortable running something similar to that without all the whoop de doo technology they have to count ballots. But uh, it's the same idea, trying to identify the best 36 at-large teams and then seed them in a way that makes sense both from a, a, a competitive balance standpoint and hopefully from a geographic standpoint. And the, the level of, uh, what would be the word? The level of knowledge and passion and interest that, quote unquote, these students, and I'm using the term loosely, I mean, if you can count to 68, you get an A in the class, okay? Uh, if, if, if you look at that and, what, and how much they study for it, I suspect, like me, if they had put that much energy into an actually profitable career, you know, they might really make something of themselves. But instead, we just get to pal around and talk hoops a, a couple nights a week. Talking with Joe Lenardi here on the Game Time Podcast. Joe, how has social media changed the scrutiny involved with putting out your brackets? You're basically spot on every year, giving a couple teams here and there. So how has social media changed the game for you? It just makes it more rapid. Uh, you know, it was a big deal in the early days with ESPN when a new bracket would go up every Monday and people would chew on that for a week. And then it was, you know, twice a week. And then it was uh, maybe go on TV and give an update on a team or two. Well, you know, now we have bracket math and tournament odds report and uh, Joey brackets this on that show. Uh, I, I, I guess people really want to know. And why not give them the immediacy of it? Because the picture really does change on a game-by-game -game basis for a lot of the schools involved. And I don't know if it's made me more accurate at the end of the process. I suspect it's actually made it less accurate because being able to reflect is helpful. And I don't have a lot of reflection time anymore, at least not now in this last, what, four week sprint. Now, one question I've always wondered who was the first person to give you the Joey Brackets nickname? That was Josh Elliott uh, when he was new at ESPN. Uh, and of course then, Good Morning America, and now with NBC, uh, I, I either blame or, or credit Josh for that. Uh, I remember uh, being on the set when that came up, and we went, then we went into commercial, and he said, I hope that that's not an insult. I said, no, but it's going to take off. And well, here we are. So Joe, let's step aside from the brackets from just a moment. You went to St. Joe's, you now get to call games for St. Joe's Radio for Basketball. What's that experience been like for you? And what's the most rewarding part of the whole process? It means I don't have to pay to get a good seat. <laughs> uh, and that's certainly a plus. And hopefully uh, convey to you know our listeners and now internet viewers for home games that, uh, I mean, look, in the grand scheme of things, we're not saving lives or being early responders here. We're getting paid or uh, at least afforded the opportunity to talk about something that we love uh, at a time of year when most people are kind of down in the dumps because of winter. So, you know, I think you can take your work seriously without necessarily taking yourself seriously. And that's just a, a personal philosophy that I try to bring to it. Uh, because I just feel incredibly blessed to be able to do it. All right, let's talk about that bracket right now. We're here at the Rose Hill Gym, Fordham St. Joe's. All right, I'm going to break it to you. <laughs> let's hear it. We're not looking at 
any bubble teams today. <laughs> That's a shame. All Maybe right. in a couple years. St. Joe's got in last year. Fordham a far cry right now. But when you look at the A-10, six teams last year. How many teams can we realistically expect this year? A good number less than six. And that certainly is not a popular view in the league offices. Uh, but the reality is the league isn't as good and it's not as old in terms of, of senior stellar performers. So it couldn't help but kind of retreat a bit. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. I think it's just a cyclical thing. I mean, you look at, at our Hawks last year, dominated by seniors, won the league. Yeah. St. Louis, dominated by seniors, won the regular season. Well, both teams are, you know, looking up at most of the standings right now. Uh, it's just the nature of the sport. There's not a lot of one and done underclass eligibles that come out of the Atlantic 10. The coaching is great. The level of competition is great. You just have to build to be good. And uh, that, that is not an easy process. So I would say at this moment, uh, we have two teams in the field, uh, uh, VCU and uh, Dayton. And given the injuries now that VCU is playing with, and the players they're playing without, I think it's fair to say that uh, a third team could absolutely win the conference tournament in Brooklyn. Uh, now, as a, you know, I don't know that St. Joseph's winning it last year gave an extra bid. Right. I think they were going anyway. Uh, so three is probably the ceiling for the Atlantic 10 this season. All right, Joe, before we let you go, one of the staples of the podcast is a rapid-fire question segment. All right. So first thing that comes to mind, you say it, and we'll get the answer, all right? Ready to roll? Here we go. I'm ready. What's one thing people don't know about Joe Lenardi? That I'm a lot uh, taller on TV. <laughs> Your favorite athlete growing up? Bobby Clark. Pats or Geno's? Pats. Your favorite sports writer of all time? Mark Wicker, uh, now in Southern California. And the best part about working for St. Joe's? Uh, the people and the students. There you have it, folks. One of the best in the industry. Joey Brackets himself, Joe Lenardi. Joe, thank you so much. I, I was going to answer nice tie to one of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have that tie game. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time here on Game Time.